Part 7. Tezzeret. He was admittedly weary. The white sand shifted under his feet as he trudged along, and he fought the high wind with every step, making every step annoyingly taxing, especially with the damaged planar bridge in his chest, leaking energy that slowly seared the surrounding flesh. He hadn't walked anywhere in ages, and the organic muscles in his calves burned, but it had been the smart choice to hike the final distance on foot, and he didn't regret it. Since leaving Amon Ket, Tezzeret had planeswalked multiple times, bouncing from world to world to ensure that tracking him would be as difficult as possible. And, if he was tracked, he didn't want the trackers popping into his fortress without warning. No, let them follow his last planeswalk, out to the far shore where he'd landed, and let them wear themselves out as he was doing before they reached him. If nothing else, he'd be able to see them coming. After all, he didn't want just anyone stumbling on him or his operation. Especially now, now that said operation truly and finally belonged to him and him alone, servicing his agenda and no one else's. Certainly not the dragons. Tezzeret had served Nicol Bolas faithfully, because Tezzeret was a realist and a pragmatist. He had served Bolas because Bolas was too powerful for Tezzeret to beat. Now, thanks to a gloating Tybalt who'd witnessed the end, Tezzeret knew Bolas was dead. Tybalt had probably confronted him to feed on Tezzeret's pain over his master's death, but Tybalt departed disappointed as Tezzeret couldn't be happier about it. After all, Bolas was the only entity in the multiverse with the power to stop his former minion. With the dragon gone, there remained no one who could stand in his way. He had reached the final canal. This was close enough. He raised his right arm, his perfect ethereum arm, and shot up a simple flare. The response was immediate. Illusory clouds parted like perfectly carved pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, and four gargoyles emerged, winging their way toward him. They were animated stone, enhanced like himself, by Ethereum. Well, to be accurate, the trio of smaller gargoyles appeared to be all but solid metal. Any living stone that remained was hardly visible to the naked eye. The fourth and biggest gargoyle was Brock, whose five glowing eyes shone out even from this distance. His body was reinforced, augmented, and decorated with Ethereum but he still retained his stony bulk and strength. With a single powerful flap of his wings, Brock soared past the trio, landing first and bowing low. Master, he intoned in his voice of gravel. The second gargoyle was close behind. It landed and genuflected silently. While its cargo, the homunculus Krnsk, practically rolled off the gargoyle's back. The diminutive sky-blue biped with her stubby ethereum arms and legs and nearly spherical body quickly prostrated herself at Tezzeret's feet. Boss, she said in her high-pitched squeak. The final two gargoyles, knowing their duty, flew past Tezzeret and circled, coming around to land flat on the ground in front of him, facing the way they'd come. He took two steps forward and stood upon their backs. Any orders? Brock asked. Quite a few, but they can wait until we're home. Go. As you command, master. Ernst, who moved rather speedily for a creature of such near-perfect roundness, quickly hopped back in the saddle of her gargoyle, which took off leading the way. Ezzeret's gargoyles followed, carrying their master. Brock took up the rear on guard for any potential threat. Erect on his feet, Tezzeret soared toward the carved-out cloud entrance to his fortress, smiling a smile of grim but authentic satisfaction. 
He no longer felt weary. The dragon was gone, and it was like a weight had been lifted, lifted off his back and placed upon the backs of billions of others. A minion no longer. He was finally the man in charge. Part 8. Ral Zarek Ral couldn't help wondering what rock Tezzeret was hiding under now. With the master dead, the minion was vulnerable, and Ral was eager to put that ethereum-armed freak down, once and for all. Those were, he realized, fairly violent thoughts for the bathtub. The water was hot, the air steamy. The suds, well, the word luxuriant came to mind. He and Tomic had retired, or retreated, to the apartment they shared in Dog's Run. A genteel neighborhood of quiet streets, tucked away from anything resembling the life pulse of Ravnica, which was how they both liked it. Tomic had gotten washed first, and then surrendered the bathroom to his partner, and Rawl had made the most of it, washing off the grit, grime, and, yes, guts of two days of the worst fighting of his life. They had won, but the price had been very, very high. Too many Izet leaguers had died, Morphix had died, and Tibor, Hongreve, and Mastiv, they as well, just to name a few that Rawl would particularly mourn and miss. Thus, Thousands of Ravnicans had perished, and who knew how many planeswalkers? Gideon Jura died. Ral had barely known the man, but had come to truly admire him over the course of the world's longest day. He couldn't imagine what his close friends in the Gatewatch were feeling. The truth was, Ral felt almost blessed. After having spent the last month feeling almost cursed, he realized he had come out of the whole horrible conflagration largely unscathed. Yes, today had literally been a global tragedy. And yes, he had lost friends. But frankly, no one he was truly close to. Aya had survived, and so had Lavinia. Braska hadn't simply survived, but had actually been redeemed in his eyes. By Crocked. Jace Bellerin had survived, and had emerged as someone that Rawl actually respected and valued. Even Hikara and Niv, who had been both perished, had both been miraculously resurrected. And more important than any of them, there was Tomic in the room. If Rawl was being honest, all of Ravnica could have burned to a cinder as long as Tomic remained beside him. When did this happen? When did this man become my whole world? Not that he was upset over the situation. A part of him was grateful that he was even capable of loving anyone this much. After Elias, he convinced himself that the whole idea of love was a fraud. He'd never been so glad to miscalculate anything in his life. The bathwater was starting to turn tepid. Rawl could have heated it up easily, but he figured he was suitably clean and sufficiently pruned by this time and he wanted Tomic, hungered for him, now. He stepped out of the tub and toweled dry. He wrapped the towel around his waist, ran a hand through his spiky hair, and left the steamy bathroom. He found Tomic sitting at the kitchen table, his nose buried in about 16 law books simultaneously. What in the world are you about? He asked Tomic, laughing. Are you seriously studying? Tonight. After everything, I'm trying to find a way to free Kaya from her hours of obligations. Trying to find a way for her to planeswalk away from Ravnica without, you know, dying. I thought you wanted her to stay. I thought you preferred her over Tessa Karlov as your guildmaster. Oh, I do. I think Kaya could be very beneficial to the syndicate. Move us on to a better path. But she's my friend. Our friend. She has to be able to choose. She shouldn't have to stay if she really doesn't want to. Nephilim Spawn. You're good. Are you sure you're Orzov? Oh, stop it, Tomic said, shaking his head and rolling his eyes. 
You stop it, Ral said, coming up behind Tomic and kissing the top of his head, the back of his head, the back of his neck. He paused and said, I love Kaya, but her problems can be solved tomorrow. Come to bed. In a minute. Ten at most. I think I'm on to something. Raul stood up straight and grumbled. Tomic, I'm wired and exhausted. Come to bed now, please, before I pass out. I want you. In fact, I cannot emphasize how much I need to be with you right now. Five minutes. All right, Ral said as languidly as he could manage. Then he removed the towel and dropped it on the kitchen table in front of his man. Without looking back, Ral turned and walked toward their bed. Either Tomic would turn around and watch him walk away, or Ral Zarek was very much losing his touch. Two minutes, Tomic squeaked. Ah, gotcha. Lover, I could be dead to the world in two minutes easy. Ral heard the chair push away from the table, and Tomic's bare feet scrambling across the hardwood floor. Coming! Part 9 Rat At dinner, in an immense and formal Orzova dining room, Rat ate as if she were storing up for winter, but between bites, it was her usual motor-mouth self. Madame Blaise is such a darling. Don't you think? She's tried three times to see me already. I mean, it's not working. But she's really putting in the effort. Most people tend to give up after 10 seconds or so, so I really appreciate the attempts, you know? I also appreciate this plum tart. Mistress Kaya, are you sure you want to leave the syndicate? Quite sure. But why? I never signed on for this job, rat. It's a responsibility I don't want on a world that isn't mine. And that's on top of the fact that this guild doesn't really want me here either. I've survived one coup attempt already. I don't relish the opportunity to not survive the next. Fair enough, Rat said, taking another bite. Still, I think a plum tart like this might be worth a coup or two. Your chef servitor has a lot of talent, and I know because I have stolen a lot of plum tarts in my day. And I mean a lot of plum tarts. Each tart's too, an apricot, and girdleberry, and well, pretty much every tart you can name. I'm like queen of the tarts. No wait, that did not come out the way I meant it to. I think not, Mr. Skaya said wryly from the head of the table. You're blushing. Am I? Again? Rat snuck a quick glance across the table at Teo, who was leaning his chin on his fist, watching her and smiling. It seems I blush quite a bit around you folks. It never used to happen to me, I swear. But then again, I've never spent this much straight time with anyone who could see me. Not since I was a little girl. Not even Hikara. Not a whole day like this. Because, you know, he has been with me since early morning. Hikara... Always had a show to perform, or an errand to run for Lord Rakdos. We, she and I, we've spent tons of time together over the years, but never a whole day. Not that this was like a fun day, although it is horrible if I admit I've had a lot of fun today, you know, in and amid all the tragedy and everything. Is it the fun that makes things more tragic, or the tragedy that makes things more fun? What do you think? Both, Kaya said bittersweetly. Rat's head bobbed up and down. Exactly. I guess that's how we measure things, right? No light without shadow. No shadow without light. No high-born guildmasters without a low-born rat to liven up their table. You know? Every table should have a rat, Kaya said. Well then, maybe I'll stay. You know... I've been gateless my whole life, always on the fence, deciding between joining Gruul, Celestia, or Rakdos. Uh, maybe I should consider Urzov as well. You'd be welcome, as long as I'm Guildmaster. Kaya swallowed and looked away. 
But that's the problem, isn't it? You don't plan on staying Guildmaster for long. Rat suddenly knew why she was talking so much. Oh sure, it wasn't exactly out of character for her, but for once, she wasn't rambling idly. She was maintaining all the verbiage to stop herself from crying. She knew what was coming, coming as soon and as certain as the morning light. She could give herself a good cry then, once she was alone. And it isn't easy for the rat to be alone in this city. Even if a few thousand people are walking right past me. But not now. She'd keep her chin up and her mouth moving so that Teo and Mistress Kaya didn't know what she was feeling. So they didn't make any decisions based on how good their hearts were. And Rat knew they had good hearts. Too good. She didn't want to influence them that way. She might just kill her if she thought they were deciding what to do with their own lives based on their pity for the rat. I'm a funny little story they can tell someday, assuming they even remember me. But either way, it's much better than becoming someone or something they resent, right? He saw Teo stifle a yawn and knew both he and Kaya had to be exhausted. It would be bedtime soon, very soon. She could hold out until then, keep things keen and fun and decidedly non-tragic until then. Of course she could, she just had to keep talking. She blurted out, So, are you really going to kill Miss Vess? Mistress Kaya looked stunned, then she frowned and said, If we can figure out a way for me to leave Ravnica without dying, then yes. But, Teo said, appalled, she saved us all. Kaya, you know she did. Mistress Kaya's frown grew more pronounced. You know how many lives died at the hand of her Eternals, Teo? Her Eternals or the dragons? Does it matter? She didn't have to use them against us. Are you so sure of that? Rat asked, sincerely curious. Everyone has a choice, Rat. One's alternatives might be spectacularly unpleasant, but that doesn't mean the choice doesn't exist. Yeah, Rat said quietly. I see that. Teo shook his head, unconvinced. Mistress Kaya's frown receded, and her expression waxed more sympathetic. Teo, I don't necessarily expect you to agree. You spent your life training to save people. I've spent mine removing dangerous individuals from the lands of the living. This is my work, not yours. You've said your piece, and I'm sorry. But you're not a part of this decision. Now Teo was frowning. Rat pretty much regretted raising such a serious topic and was about to launch into a gossipy recounting of Mistress Zarek and Miss Verona's progress from bedmates to soulmates when Madame Blaze entered, walked up to Mistress Kaya, leaned down, bending very properly at the waist, and whispered, The triumvirate requests an audience, Miss Mistress. Now? Here? Kaya whispered back. I told them it was late and that you were at dinner, but they insist on paying their respects. The triumvirate wishes to pay me respects. So oh, they say, mistress. At Layard's true respect isn't on the dinner menu, but fine, send them in. Yes, mistress. Madame Blaise straightened and departed. They leaned over the table and asked, who are these folks again? And why are they so important? Mistress Kaya said, The Triumvirate have considerable power and influence in the guild. You see, Mistress Kaya assassinated the Obsidat, the ghost council that used to run the Orzov Syndicate. That's how she became Guildmaster. Though that was not my intent, Kaya clarified. Mm, no, Rat said. But that was the result. And the Triumvirate do not like it. With the ghosts gone, the three of them have gained considerable power, which they should be grateful to Mistress Kaya for. But instead, they resent her, which seems pretty unreasonable to me. There is much that's unreasonable about this guild, Mistress Kaya said. But their conversation was cut off as the Triumvirate 
entered one at a time, each announced by Madame Blaze, and each accompanied by a small thrall on a leash that did nothing, as far as anyone could tell, except make its master look more important. Pontiff Armin Morov. The pontiff was a human, the patriarch of the Morov family hierarchs. He was quite old, with graying skin, and a withered right hand, and absolutely no hair, looking very much as if he were already well prepared to join a reformed Obsidat. Tithe Master Slavomir Zoltan. The Tithe Master was a dangerously handsome vampire, with, for an undead bloodsucker, a curious obsession with increasing his material wealth. Milady Maladola. Milady was an angel, a long ago defector from the Boros Legion, who now acted as the Orzov's chief warrior executioner, a position she profited by mightily. Each chose a seat, neither close to their guildmaster nor close to one another, forcing everyone to shout in order to be heard. This seemed to be a favored strategy with the trio, as they had done the same thing when Mistress Kaya had first attempted, unsuccessfully, to rally their forces into the fight against Nikol Bolas. Pontiff Morov began. We are so relieved to see that you are safe and whole, Guildmaster. Yes, Tithe Master Zoltan continued. It seems your concerns over the Dragon Bolas were perhaps overstated. Shifting a bit in her seat, Milady Maladola cleared her throat and said, Or if not overstated. Yet there was some wisdom in holding back a portion of our forces as we did. The other guilds committed everything. And if there's further trouble from anyone, we are in a prime position to respond as needed. Mistress Kaya glowered. I am very grateful to Chief Enforcer Bilagru for rallying as much of my guild's military might as he did. And I am grateful to you, Executioner, for your eventual participation as well. The fact that Chief Maladola had, at the last minute, personally joined the fight against the dragon's forces seemed to come as some surprise to the angel's two fellow triumvirs. Tithe Master Zoltan said, You did battle, milady. Pontiff Morov hissed, That's not what we discussed. Chief Maladola looked briefly uncomfortable, but then stood up and leaned forward, her hands braced on the table, her arms stiff and straight. I exercise my duties as I see fit, he said, daring either of them to disagree. Even her thrall seemed to sense its mistress's cold rancor as it began growling at the pontiff's thrall until the chief executioner gave a fast, brutal tug on its leash. Tithe Master Zoltan made an attempt to smooth the waters. Of course, milady, as you see fit, what's important is that we present a united front against all of Orzov's potential enemies. His glance from the angel to their guildmaster was less than subtle, and Chief Maladola took the hint and took her seat. Mistress Kaya said, Are you implying I'm a potential enemy? I'm sure that was the farthest idea from the Tithe Master's mind, Mistress, Morov said unctuously. You are an integral part of said united front. Hence, our need to pay our kind respects tonight. We would not want you to feel unattended or unobserved. How good to know. Isn't it, though? Zoltan said, with a deferential nod that wasn't truly deferential at all. Still, you must be fatigued, mistress, the angel said. We must leave you to your meal and your rest. Thank you. Thus, with a few more pleasantries, spoke less than pleasantly, the triumvirate took their leave. Earlier in the day, their thrall leashes had become embarrassingly tangled when they had tried to depart. Careful this time to avoid a repetition 
There was a wealth of after use spoken before they actually e exited. Once they were gone, Kaya violently slammed her pewter goblet down on the table. They say just enough to let me know we're at war. Yet not enough for me to take action against them. Gods and monsters. I hate being Guildmaster. If killing Vess means someone will be forced to figure out a way for me to ditch these obligations, then I'll kill a hundred Lilianas. This brought another scowl to Teo's face, but for Rat, mostly served to confirm that Mistress Kaya would leave the Orzov and Ravnica as soon as she was able. Guess there's no point in me joining Orzov with her leaving it. Besides, Orzov really isn't my style. An uncomfortable looking Teo grabbed a plum from a fruit bowl and pretended to study it. He glanced up at Rat and down at the fruit and up at Rat and down at the fruit. What? Rat asked. Looking up again and then away, he mumbled, Yes, adorably, that the plum was the same color as Rat's eyes. Then he quickly took a bite. This plum! He said rapturously, and with his mouth half full, Best plum ever? Best plum ever! It's so much sweeter and juicier than any plum I've ever ate on Gobakan. Gobakan, Teo would return to Gobakan tomorrow morning, and Kaya would leave her guild and Ravnica just as soon as she was able. It's inevitable. Madame Blaze entered once again, and once again she approached Mistress Kaya to whisper in her ear. But before she could say anything, another voice called out, Well, look at this keen feast and all this keen company. It was Hikara, in her keen new blood witch regalia, leaning against the door jamb. Madame Blaze straightened to her full height and spoke with some umbrage. I told you to wait in the hallway. And wait I did, Hikara said. Two seconds or more. Then I came to save you the trouble of announcing me. It's fine, Blaze. Kaya said, allowing a smile to begrudgingly replace the anger she felt toward the triumvirate. Madame Blaze nodded curtly and departed, but not before Hikara performed an impressive series of backflips that resulted in her standing with her arms up atop the dining room table, with one foot in a bowl of savory pudding. Ta-da! Teo mumbled. Your foot. Hikara smiled down at him. It's okay. Did it on purpose. I'm a tad peckish just now. She sat herself down on the table and contorted her body so that she could lick the brown pudding off the bell on her slipper. Mmm, so good. She untwisted herself and said, I'll finish the rest later. She will too, you know, Rat said. It's kind of disgusting and wonderful all at the same time. But Hikara talked right over her, saying, When I leave pudding footsteps across Ravnica, it's like I'm sharing my meal with the world. And then when I do settle down to eat, it's like I'm enjoying a side of Ravnica with my entree. Hearing their crossed words, Mistress Kaya said, Hikara, Rat is here, in this room. I know things have changed, but Ral Zarek can see her if he focuses. I'm sure you could too. She's sitting here, I gestured with her right hand, in the chair to my right. Rat didn't have to be slightly telepathic to see Hikara's upper lip twitch as she said, Sure, Rat's my girl. I can focus on her. I can see Rat, but being slightly telepathic, Rat could feel how antsy the topic made Hikara. With obvious reluctance and not a little fear, Hikara turned toward Rat's chair. Now, all I have to do is focus, right? I know how this works. I've seen her father do it all the time, and I should have had a head start, because Rat's always been my best mate. I've always been able to see her. That is until I died, right? 
died and got resurrected as a blood witch. And she's still my rat. And I'm still her Hikara. But the more she talked, the more nervous she became. Rat couldn't bear it any longer and said to Mistress Kaya, Don't make her. Tell her I left the room. But please, please. I'm sorry, Hikara. Rat seems to have left the room. Instantly, Hikara's entire frame seemed to relax. I'm sorry to... I'm sorry. I missed her. Rat got a distinct sense that Hikara knew she was being let off the hook, and that she was grateful for it. Her new inability to see Rat now worried the Blood Witch, or scared her. After all, if Hikara had lost that, what else might she have lost when she died? Yes, I'm sorry. I missed her. Hikara repeated more quietly to no one in particular. Then she whispered sadly, I do miss her. He's my rat. I'm your rat, Rat whispered back, knowing Hikara wouldn't hear. Rat knew from experience that even folks who did manage to see her for a long time forgot what she looked and sounded like a few minutes, if not seconds, after they lost focus on her. In fact, when Rat stayed away too long, even her own mother started to forget her. Though Ari Shakta had never admitted this out loud to her daughter, Hikara would soon forget Rat ever existed in her life, so Hikara won't be sad about missing her Rat for very long. It suddenly occurred to Rat that joining the cult of Rakdos was out of the question now that Hikara was no longer in her corner. No Rakdos, no Orzhov, just Gruul and Celestia as her only options, until inevitably they weren't options either. Because without Hikara, Rat had no peers or friends native to Ravnica, who were staying on Ravnica, who were consistently able to see her, just her mother and her godfather, until inevitably they forgot how to see her too. Hikara didn't stay long, Mistress Kaya had spoiled her mood. She cartwheeled away, leaving Teo to try to cheer Rat up by saying things clearly intended to get her to tease him. Mistress Kaya remained silent, and Rat could tell she was mulling over Rat's isolation and loneliness. She was sympathetic, she and Teo both were. But Rat was adamantly determined not to burden either of them, to put on a happy face, talked a bit more about fruit tarts, and intentionally put a milk mustache on her face for Teo to shyly point out until, finally, Madame Blaze appeared to escort all three to their bedchambers for the night. Part 10. Vraska Their victory had been sweet, but this was sweeter. Vraska and Jace made love. It had been a long time coming, something they had both wanted since being shipmates aboard the belligerent on the plain of Ixalan. Something they had delayed because fate had never been kind to either of them. Nicol Bolas had still loomed large on the horizon. Now the weight made every kiss, every touch, all the more tender. And with her permission, he had telepathically connected what they had felt for each other. What they were feeling for each other. Every sensation was reflected back and doubled. This is very intense. Very intense. Very. Very. In that moment, they were one mind, one body, one soul. Collapsing down atop his chest, she kissed him over and over. He held her tight. She came close to saying, But no, not yet. I can't. Not yet. He said, I think I've fallen in love with you. He he laughed out loud and said, I love you too. So yes, yet. He laughed again. They kissed again. Eventually feeling drowsy, he rolled off him and they spooned. Is this what normal folk do? Just hold each other like this? Just enjoy each other like this? His breathing became regular behind her. She loved the fact that Jace felt comfortable enough to fall asleep with his arms encircling her body. Besides, he must be exhausted. 
I know I am. And yet she didn't sleep. Instead, she enjoyed the afterglow of their lovemaking. Her mind wandered through their history together, their time aboard the ship, the hunt for the immortal sun, the various psychic revelations that had cemented her feelings for him, and his for her. It was so strange since the two of them were so different and yet so much alike. Unfortunately, her mind kept wandering to less pleasant concerns. Ultimately, to the one concern that almost always filled her thoughts, the welfare of the Golgari Swarm. She was the Golgari Queen now, and, though no one was more surprised than Vraska, she seemed to have inspired much loyalty within her guild. Certainly among the Teratogens, those of the Swarm who were neither human nor elf. Especially among the erstwhile and the Kral, Storav and Asdomas were more faithful to her than she deserved. But Vraska was also well aware that the Devarkin elves, led by their high priests, Matka Izoni Thousand-Eyed, wanted her gone. Gone so that Izoni and the Dev Karin could once again take cruel control over the swarm. It was little consolation knowing the rest of the swarm didn't trust or even like the Dev Karin. Because Vraska knew it would be unwise to underestimate their power particularly when she also had nine other guilds with which to contend. Nine guilds currently insisting she once again do the work of an assassin, something she had hoped she'd given up forever. Not the killing per se, but the idea of being ordered to kill at the beck and call of others. What by crocked do I care about Dovin Ban? Zeno for your thoughts? Jace was awake, and her dark musings pulled him from slumber. Were they still psychically attached? How much does he know? How much did he learn? With a gentle hand, he turned her face toward his. I was dreaming of Vryn, he said sleepily. Yes? She whispered, relieved. Now that I have all my memories back, I have to admit, I'm eager. Yeah, eager to planeswalk there. I don't blame you. It's your home world. How could you not want to see it again? It's a little scary, actually. Ah, oh. he stroked his stubbly chin. He stroked her tendrils, which got her going a little again. Would you go with me? Before she could respond or object. He quickly added, I know you can't leave the Golgari for long, but perhaps a short trip? A week? He looked into his eyes, the candlelight reflected in them. She found herself reflected in them too. He thought he looked at her as if she were all there was to see. She kissed his soft, soft lips and said, a week sounds lovely. You're lovely, he said. He rolled on top of her. She liked the feel of his weight upon her. She liked the feel of the other things he was starting to do as well. This feels right, so right. Jace and I, a couple, better than I could have dreamed. They began again.